morning, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you on this lovely Sunday morning. Let's all stand, please, and grab our blue songbook. Go to number 243, number 243. We'll sing all three verses of victory in Jesus. Number 243, think of the words, think of your salvation. Let's praise the Lord together. Number 243, victory in Jesus. Join me on the first. Everyone standing, please, and sing it out. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flow. On the last, I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing of them the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen, amen. Do you have victory in Jesus? Amen. And the victory is so simple. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's anyone who comes to him, he will in no wise cast out. Praise the Lord. Amen. It was good to see some smiling faces this morning. That's wonderful. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Good to see everybody. Good to see uh, our visitors come back uh, and uh, enjoy a Sunday, another Sunday with us. Thanks for coming and, and all of the, uh, the uh, folks who are here uh, normally. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's good to see everybody. Let's uh, open up with a word of prayer and uh, we will get started. Brother Ramsey, do you mind praying for us, please? Amen. You may be seated. Turn again into your songbook, number 208, number 208. We'll sing the first and last verse of number 208. Think of the words as you sing. Grace greater than our sin, number 208. Join me in the first. 
Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace Freely bestowed on all who believe You that are longing to see His face Will you this moment His grace receive? Grace, grace God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Amen, amen. What wonderful grace we have, amen. Amen. Don't forget that this evening, the ladies, you have your ensemble practice at 5 o'clock. And so uh, they're practicing uh, getting something ready for next week, right? Oh, good. Next week's Mother's Day. Have you been thinking about your Mother's Day gift? Men? Men? Okay. A little friendly reminder. Amen. After the service, after the, service uh, the food pantry will be open, so feel free to... After the service, the food pantry will be open, so feel free to uh, stop by and uh, if, you, if you need anything, or just stop by and browse. Maybe something will meet your fancy and you'll just want to take it home. But it's there um, for everyone. It's there to be a blessing if you need it, or if you know of somebody who needs it, feel free to, to, to stop by and, and uh, utilize it. That's what it's there for, okay? So um, there's, it's just open for everybody. So I want to make sure everybody's aware of that. Also, I um, want to wish... Brother Tony, a happy birthday. It's his birthday on the 8th and on the 9th, I'm sorry. And then Sarah Ramon also has a birthday this week, so be sure to text her. She usually comes with Miss Christie. And I'll be sure to reach out to her and wish her a happy birthday this week. Amen. All right. Amen. Well, it's good to see some uh, returning uh, faces. Uh, Sherry and Corey, it's good to see you. Good to see you both. Amen. Jennifer, it's good to see you. Praise the Lord. Uh, Miss Felicia with uh, Miracle and Darius and Aaron. Aaron, good to see you again. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. And then we have John and Mary. Praise the Lord. It's good to see you all again. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Let's grab our songbooks one more time. We're going to go to number 127 as we stand and get uh, prepare for the scripture reading to follow. Let's all stand and sing the first, second, and fourth verse of Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Number 127. Number 127. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. 
Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust thee, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that thou art with me, wilt be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Amen. You'll never go wrong trusting in Jesus. Amen. You trust him as your Savior, you can trust him every day of your life. Amen. Let's grab our Bibles. We're going to go to Philippians. In the New Testament, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Everybody's standing for the Bible reading. Thank you. Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to ask Brother Tony if he would come and lead us in our scripture reading from Philippians chapter 4 this morning. Good morning. Open your Bibles to Philippians. We'll be in chapter 4. I'll be reading verses 1 through 9. Philippians 4, verses 1 through 9. I'll begin and you respond accordingly. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Judeus and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and there be any praise, think on these things. Verse 9, together. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Let's pray. Father, it's good to be back in your house on Sunday, Lord, after being a, a week out in the world. We thank you for our visitors here today, Lord. We thank you for how it went last Sunday. We're looking for something big to happen today, Lord. I ask you to challenge our hearts as we sit here. May we go on to be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. We thank you for this reading, Lord. It's, it's a... It's a description, it's a recipe for peace, Lord. Uh, the world's looking for peace. It comes through Jesus Christ. It doesn't come through drugs and alcohol and all the other things out there, entertainment, our phones, the Internet, but through Jesus Christ. May we purpose to do these things, to think on these things that you told us to think about, the true, the honest, the just, Lord, the lovely, the good report. And, and this is what promise you give us. We will have peace of mind, the peace of the Lord. But if we don't follow it, Lord, we get upset and things aren't going our way and we don't have that peace. And I just pray, Lord, that we purpose this week to be in your word, to be in prayer time, listen for your small, still voice, and to obey you when you prompt us to do something, Lord, to reach out to those around us, to get out of our comfort zones and go out and tell a lost and dying world of Jesus Christ. Bless our, bless our service here today. Fill our pastor with the fullness of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated.
children and purges in love. My Father knows best, and I trust in His care. Through purging, more fruit I will bear. Oh, rejoice in the Lord, He makes no mistakes. He three of the loveliest, loveliest ladies in the church. Amen. I might be kind of biased. Amen. Go to Philippians chapter 4. I need my prayer warriors to pray that that little winged thing stays in his seat right there. Um, I apologize for that. I want to focus on the verse 4 where it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, Rejoice, Heavenly Father, please take your word. I pray, pray that you please minister to our hearts. Help us to see how we can apply this very simple truth and how we can take advantage of the riches of your kingdom. I pray, Lord, that you please help us, Lord, remove all distractions. Help us to focus on what you have for us this morning. I pray you please fill me with the Holy Spirit's power. I pray you please bind the evil one. I pray that you please rebuke him, that he would have no place here. Lord, I ask that you please speak to our hearts. Lord, there are, there are people who need to hear from heaven. Remove all distractions. Lord, I ask that you please be merciful to us, meet with us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you could do me a favor and just turn your phones on silent, please, I'd appreciate that. Ron Hamilton, desiring to respond rightly after the horrible experience of losing an eye to cancer when he was just a young man, spent the time afterwards meditating on Philippians and the verses that were written in the cards he had received and penned the words to the song you just heard, Rejoice in the Lord. Did you catch the words? God never moves without purpose or plan when trying his servant and molding a man. Give thanks to the Lord, though your testing seems long. In darkness he giveth a song. O oh, rejoice in the Lord. He makes no mistakes. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. I could not see through the shadows ahead, so I looked at the cross of my Savior instead. Think about the words that he chose for this song. What had he just suffered? The loss of his eye. What does he say? I could not see through the shadows ahead, so I looked at the cross of my Savior instead. I bowed to the will of of the master that day, then peace came and tears fled away. Now I can see testing comes from above. God strengthens his children and purges in love. My father knows best, and I trust in his care. Through purging, more fruit I will bear. Oh, rejoice in the Lord. He makes no mistakes. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. 
Ron Hamilton, the author of this beautiful song, embraced this trial that God had brought him through and truly sought with his life to rejoice in the Lord, always, even in this. Just like when Paul was exhorting these Philippian Christians, these believers here in Philippians, he was exhorting them in our text verse, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. But why? Would it be a lot more, I'm going to use bad English, would it be a lot more funner to complain? The flesh would like to complain, but Paul says rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Why? Why rejoice? Why did Paul see this practice of rejoicing in the Lord as being so important? Because, number one, rejoicing in the Lord brings great humility. Brings great humility. You see, a person may have great talents. But that person with great talents, they may easily fall into the trap of great pride because of something that they had nothing to do with. Jesus said, Can any of you by thought add one cubit or 18 inches to your height? Can you think, I'm taller, I'm taller, I'm taller, I'm taller. I'm taller. Oh, I'm growing. I'm growing. When my wife and I were courting, uh, she was telling me about... Uh, Wanting to grab a puzzle down from her closet, knowing that she was shorter than me, I uh, kindly asked, uh, uh, are you vertically challenged? Do you, need, do you need help with that? I love you, hon. <laughs> but you can't think and make yourself taller. You can't think and change things about you just because you, you think you can that's where, that's where some of the agendas that are going on today, people think that, hey, I can take some medicine, I can take this, I can, I can change these unalterable facts about me. You stop, stop putting that stuff in and see what happens. You're going to go back to normal, how you were born. It's craziness. You can't. So this person with great talent, they may fall into the, easily into a trap of great pride if they do not learn to rejoice in the Lord. A, great, a person with great, uh, great wealth may also fall into that trap. Do you know Deuteronomy says that the Lord gives us power to get wealth? Yeah. Power to get wealth. That power to get wealth comes from God. Right. That power includes the smarts. It includes the physical ability. It includes the heart continuing to pump. Try to go get wealth without your heart pumping. Yeah. That's a very necessary thing. Try to do it without air in your lungs. Your lungs, it does it involuntarily. God keeps it going. And if God says, I'm shutting the switch off, you're not going to go get wealth. So a person with great talent, great wealth, great abilities, greatness, they can easily fall into the trap of great pride if they do not learn to rejoice in the Lord. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty. And before honor is humility. Amen. You see, it's God that gives us any ability. Or, in fact, any good thing. What, is, what does James say? Every good gift and every perfect gift cometh from above. Do you have good things in your life? No. Who did it come from? Lord. The Lord. He simply brought it into your life because he loves you so much for a season. Any ability or any good thing that God gives to us that we possess, that we get to enjoy, we would be wise to understand that and realize that God gave it to us for a special purpose in his plan. So that should, with that realization, realizing that it was entrusted to us, it was, it, we are stewards of whatever that is, it would be really wise for us to learn to rejoice in the Lord. Right. We have little children. 
And uh, Ariana, many times, she will, she will make baked cookies at the house. And uh, Josiah has been one that has really been attracted to cooking and baking, as you can tell. He's a little, a little more robust. He loves, he's learned to lick the bowl. Amen. But he gets, he gets, he climbs up there and, and he, and he learns uh, uh, how to, how to, how to do that. Cooking either the cookies or the brownies or whatever it is. It is a special thing to him to be a part of the process. He may do more licking than he actually does helping, but he enjoys being a part. And to be a part of God's special plan, to be a part of God's special plan, that's, that's a joy that God wants to share with us. So when God gives us that opportunity, we should realize every good gift and every perfect gift coming from above and turn around and rejoice in the Lord. And praise him for it. So we should rejoice in the Lord for that opportunity. Because rejoicing in the Lord will bring great humility. We should be humble about the opportunities God has given us. Paul understood that very well. You see, he remembered what was written of his life in Acts chapter 9. Where it says that Saul, before he got saved, he was called Saul. This is Paul speaking or Paul, his life. Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near, to, near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. His, prior, his life prior to being saved was one of persecuting Christians. Right. He was a terrorist right. of that day. He hurt people. He hurt Christians. Right. People who believed in Jesus Christ. He put him in prison. He would take their lives. He was at the, if you go to the end of chapter 8, he was there at the stoning of Stephen. Yeah. Have you ever seen, any, seen anybody be stoned? I'm not talking about that stone. I'm, I'm talking about stoned. Yeah. He was in there watching it, holding the coats of the people participating in that atrocity. He realized that what he was being allowed to do for God. Preach the gospel was an opportunity given to him by God. Because he witnessed, he abetted the murder of his fellow citizens, yet he wasn't charged. Because it was in the name of religion. There in Damascus is where Paul's life was turned around. Listen to what was said to an Ananias, the one who led him to Jesus Christ. Verse 10 says, And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And he hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias said, Lord, I have heard by many of this men how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here hath he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my sake. His life was turned around. He went to Damascus seeking to imprison and incarcerate believers and came out one of them. You see, God had a special opportunity for Paul despite his past failures, and that is why Paul rejoiced in the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for the opportunity. 
See, God had given him this heavenly opportunity. Some with that much popularity, some with that much renown, would strut in pride and think highly of themselves. But that's why Paul said, be, be careful, don't think too highly of yourself, lest you fall. Rejoicing the Lord brings great humility because you realize all the opportunities that you've been given by God. Not only that, but it brings great humility about the arrangement of contacts in one life. Have you ever experienced that? Where you were at an unplanned place and met an unexpected person and became unwavering friends or even mates in life. That's God orchestrating. That's God orchestrating. Miss Corey, that was God orchestrating. The timing, the timing of my wife leaving the church, walking to the house. You should have missed her. That's God orchestrating those things. Amen. When I first got here, Brother Luis, I'm glad you're here. I was knocking doors over around Loomis Park, over in Jackson. We knocked that area. After we had knocked, it was kind of a cold day, so we went to the diner right across the street from Loomis Park, which is now closed down. It was a diner there. We walked in there, got a cup of soup. And as we were sitting there talking, I heard, heard some, some Spanish being talked. I was like, wow, I haven't heard Spanish in a, in a little bit. And I approached Luis and his friend and talked to them and met them, presented the gospel to them. Little did I know that nine months later or so, all of a sudden Tanya shows up and she is an answer to prayer. And then she tells me about her fiancé and I inquire about her. And he, she tells me he's Luis. Luis uh, told me about the church. We put two and two together and realized it's the same Luis that I met at the, at the diner that day. That was God orchestrating that. Having us there at that same place, that was God orchestrating that. I mean, have you ever experienced that where, where you, you, you cross paths at exactly, had you been two seconds later, you would have missed it? Yeah. That's a reason to rejoice in the Lord. Amen. You, 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 it, it, Paul understood this, and he showed great humility about the opportunities that were given him by God, about how God arranged the contacts in his life. You know... Do you know this contact in Paul's life that had a positive effect on him and is still affecting you and others because of it? Let me read you about this person that crossed paths with Paul. Acts 9, verse 26 says, And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed, that word essayed is he attempted, he tried, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. I wonder why. And believe not that he was disciple. This guy, he is trying to infiltrate our church to do us harm. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he, Paul, was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. It's because of Paul, because of Paul's meeting with Barnabas. And Barnabas taking him under his wing, that Paul was able to grow in the faith, then become a missionary, get to Rome, get the gospel over to Rome, which went through Europe, which went to England, which came to America. Amen. That's a reason to rejoice in the Lord. Amen. How many people have had their life plucked out of obscurity because they were discovered? Plucked out of obscurity. On TV, you see it all the time. You have these programs where, where we have amateur people come in and they'll, they'll, they'll offer, offer people contracts and stuff. But, but, but for the Lord, for, for, for spiritual reasons, wow, what, what an opportunity to be, to be plucked out of obscure, uh, obscurity. Why was Paul plucked out of obscurity by Paul, by Barnabas, and mentored by him? Don't you think there were other more 
respectable churchgoers that Barnabas could have mentored with not so much bad baggage? Why Paul? Maybe Paul never got a clear answer to that question. And so he knew the answer. It was because of God. God had a special plan for him. And so he couldn't keep from rejoicing. Thank you for choosing me. It's kind of like, kind of like thinking of yourself as you're one of the nails in a, in a box of nails. And you're going to make this big thing. And God... He reaches down and he picks you up. Out of all the nails in the bucket, he picks you up and gives you a place. And you stay there in that place until further notice. That's, that's just like us. God picking us up. That should cause a person to rejoice in the Lord. Rejoicing in the Lord brings great humility about the opportunities given to one by God, about the arrangement of contacts in one's life, and it also allows me to be authentic with others. You see, when I rejoice in the Lord, and I understand all of this orchestration that has gone on, I realize that I'm just a pawn on the chessboard, on God's chessboard. So there's no image for me to maintain. Because it's his glory that's at stake, not mine. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, By the grace of God, I am what I am. In Acts, he had no problem telling the, the people about his hum humble craft of being a tent maker. He met with Aquila and Priscilla. And he said, I'm a tent maker too, just like you. There was no image. He, he didn't say, you know, I go around starting churches and I'm a missionary. He, he was just humble about it. Here's something he, can, he admitted to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 2, he says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Why? that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Amen. Right. See, his rejoicing in the Lord, realizing the opportunity that God had given him, realizing how God had arranged all these contacts, it allowed him to be authentic. It allowed him to be genuine, not, not pretentious, not have a facade that he had to, an image that he had to try to uphold, because he knew it was all God. You see, this great humility caused Paul to not have a problem with Jesus or others getting all the glory for what he spent his life on. He didn't have a problem. You want to take the credit? Take the credit. I don't care. I'm just glad to be a part of it. Yeah. Kind of like uh, if, you're on a, if you ever play on a, a championship team and you were the last guy, you were the water boy on the, on the bench. And they gave a trophy to everybody on the team. It's like, man, I'm glad just to be the water boy. I got me a trophy. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm trophy water boy. We, our team won a championship. But that, that, that young man, he's got a very important part. He keeps everybody else hydrated. He's a very important cog in the whole system. And that's what we are. Rejoicing in the Lord brings great humility. You, you, humility about the opportunities that God has given you. Humility about the arrangement of contacts in your life. It allows you and me to be authentic with others, and that is a blessing to God's heart. What does it say in Acts 9.22 about Paul? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews, which dwelt at Damascus, Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. This is how God does stuff in people's lives. This guy turns, turned his life around like over, and I came here to do his harm, and now he's one of our team members, one of our best, excelling team members. Yeah. That's God. That blesses God's heart. You see, Paul understood that one day this would happen. Philippians 2 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He knew that one day he was going to have to bow before God. Why not start now? <laughs> Why not start now? Rejoicing in the Lord brings great humility. But not only that, rejoicing in the Lord brings great stability. Great stability. Name me the famous landmark that sits at the doorway between the Mediterranean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean. Brother Tompkins? 
Yeah, there you go. go. The, the rock, rock of your body. Is it still there? It still has it moved? Have they moved it? Do you th anybody think that they will ever move it? Do they have the capacity to move it? Not unless you had some spaceship with some lifting technology or whatever. But rejoicing in the Lord brings great stability. When you learn to rejoice in the Lord always, you can endure waves of suffering and sorrow like the rock of Gibraltar. They come crashing against you. You ain't moving. You can endure those waves of suffering and sorrow. Why? Because you're looking unto Jesus and not the tongues of shiftless men. You see, a solid rock, what does it do? When I was a child in Costa Rica, we would walk to the bus stop. We lived up in a neighborhood called El Carmen. And we could catch the bus right at the end of our street. But if we missed the bus, because it came every 20 minutes, we could walk down the hill to the public bus stop. There was a smaller um, micro bus, if you want to call it that. Or there was the larger public bus that was down the hill. And as you would go down the hill, there was this large boulder, probably, probably as, tall as, as tall as this room, just a large boulder standing, sitting by, beside the, the side of the road. You know what? Every time we went to school, you know why I remember this, this large boulder? I'm sorry about that, guys. Please. Every time, you know why I remember this large boulder? Because every time I would walk down that hill, it was there. And that's why I remember it. What, is a, what, a, what does a solid rock do? What does a large boulder do? It sits there consistently. Meditate about that large boulder and you'll, you'll, you'll find some very great qualities for life. It perseveres. It perseveres. It doesn't matter the storm. It doesn't matter if a car hits it or if, or if somebody paints it and defaces it. It doesn't move. I love these rocks around the, the, the towns where they, everybody paints them. Happy birthday to so-and-so. Happy birthday. It's just like a public rock. <laughs> it's a, I love it. I love the idea. But it just sits there. That's, that's what we should be. You see, when you rejoice in the Lord, it brings you great stability because, because you realize you're here for his purpose. What if these rocks in, in Chelsea and, and Napoleon and Jackson that, that everybody paints, they sit there and they're open for everybody. Paint on me, they say. Design me however you want. They're an open canvas. That's how, that's how we ought to be with God. Lord, I'm an open canvas. Do what you will. Rejoice in the Lord. It brings great stability. The rock of Gibraltar, how many countless crashing waves has it taken? How many severe storms has it endured? But it never wavers. It never moves. Paul had his soul anchored in the truths of God's word. It was this deep understanding of the nature and character of God that caused Paul to remain upright because of what was in the ballast of his life, even in tempestuous seas. He knew that Christ was the same yesterday, today, and forever. He knew that Malachi 3 said, I am the Lord, I change not. You see, Paul, he made a choice to rejoice, and it brought him great stability. Paul rejoiced in the presence of God. When shadows fall and the night covers all, there are things that my eye cannot see. I never fear, for the Savior is near. My Lord abides with me. Paul rejoiced in the sovereignty of God. As we heard in the song, God never moves without purpose or plan. When trying his servant and molding a man, give thanks to the Lord, though your testing seems long. In darkness he giveth a song. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Amen. You realize that nothing comes into a person's life that doesn't first pass through the hand of Almighty God. Amen. It doesn't come into your life without passing through his hand first. No trial comes into your life without first going through God's hand. No hurt 
goes through your life without first passing through God's hand. No blessing comes into your life without first going through God's hand and no loss. Nothing. It doesn't matter what it is. Paul rejoiced in the goodness of God. Has God been good to you? Do you rejoice about it? God is good through every trial and test. God is good, and I know his way is best. Even when I cannot see the purpose of his plan, still I understand God is good. Not only does rejoicing in the Lord bring great humility, but it also brings great stability. You see, it's in the time of God's testing and trying of our lives where we find that we grow the most spiritually. So teach yourself to rejoice in the Lord about that. God's stretching you. God's stretching you. Sometimes when life seems gentle and blessings flood my way, I turn my gaze away from you and soon forget to pray. But when the sky grows darker and courage turns to fear, my anxious voice cries upward with words you long to hear. Lord, I need you. When the sea of life is calm, oh Lord, I need you when the wind is blowing strong. Whether trials come or cease, keep me always on my knees. Lord, I need you. Oh Lord, I need you. When life knocks you off your feet and onto your knees, you're in a pretty good place to pray. And that's a great time to rejoice in the Lord. We will never get to a point in our life where here on earth, we do not need God. We'll never get to a point in our life where we do not need God. And those who keep that in mind will weather the storms of life so much better than those who forget that truth. It was Paul's knowledge of the character of God and the word of God as he continually communed with God that brought great stability into his life as he rejoiced in the Lord. That's why Paul admonished to the church in our text, Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Amen. Always. And again I say, rejoice. That's a double emphasis. Rejoice. Not only does rejoicing in the Lord bring great humility, and not only does rejoicing in the Lord bring great stability, but rejoicing in the Lord brings great tranquility. Look at what Paul said to these Christians in our text. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Then he says in verse 5, let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. Then in verse 6 he says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Then look at verse 7. And what? The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. But what comes first? What came first? Rejoicing comes first. And what is the end result? The peace of God. You see, you can't have the peace of God without first rejoicing. Missionary Otto Koning to Papua New Guinea, he once said that we will get much more done in our Christian life by surrendering and rejoicing than by begging and pleading. If we could just learn to surrender, when, when times are tough, when, when it seems like we've got lots of problems, if we could just learn to sit down and say, Lord, I want to thank you for these problems. I want to rejoice. I want to praise you that I'm getting a, a cut in pay. I want to praise you that I'm getting less hours uh, 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 because for some reason you've, you, 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 you're giving me less hours. So I just want to praise you for it. I want to praise you for this sickness. I want to rejoice that I've got these health problems. I want to rejoice that our car got totaled. Get a new car. Amen. But you get much more done by surrendering and rejoicing than by begging and pleading. If you want to enjoy the peace of God, it starts with rejoicing in the Lord. One of the most sought for things and one of the most difficult things to find by most of mankind is this idea or sense of peace. Most can never find it. Most can never discover it. Do you know why? 
They're looking in the wrong places. They're looking in the wrong places. The last place that you would think to look for peace was where Paul, the apostle, wrote these very words that we read in Philippians. A prison cell. If you were in prison, would you be thinking about peace? But that's where Paul wrote these. Wrote these words. He, was, he wrote these words in a prison cell in Philippi. Yet despite Paul's circumstances at the time, he knew the pathway to peace. And that's what he was teaching the Philippians. The pathway to peace is number one. Step one, rejoice always. He says rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice always. That's the first step. The second step, be gracious to everyone. He says let your moderation. That word moderation means mild, gentle, gracious. Let your graciousness be known. That word known means felt, perceived unto all men. Let your graciousness be felt by everyone. Then he says, the Lord is at hand, implying that the Lord is right beside you. Have you ever, have you ever seen that Andy Griffith episode where Barney's crossing the street and he's kind of ticked off and he doesn't look at the traffic and this truck comes and runs over his foot and Opie's standing right behind him and he's like, oh, you're on my foot, you're on my foot, you're on my foot and he, he's, you know he's wanting to say something. He says, Opie, go in there, you're cramping my style. <sighs> he restrained himself because of Opie's presence. Paul's saying here, be gracious to everyone because the Lord is standing right beside you. Would you really say that if Jesus was standing right beside you? I think it's time for invitation. I need to hit the altar. Step three, be full, be, be careful for nothing. That word careful is the word anxiety, anxious. And as I have explained this English diction rule, Anxiousness and eagerness are two different things, okay? You use eagerness when you're looking forward to something with delight. You use the word anxious when you're looking forward to something with dread. I am so anxious about seeing my relatives come. Really? Are they that bad? <laughs> Eager. And he says here, be anxious be careful, full of care about nothing. Don't be anxious about anything. But then he says, step four, but in everything by prayer and supplication, be praying about everything. So he gives you the pathway to peace. He says, be rejoicing always, be gracious to everyone, be anxious for nothing, and be praying about everything. And then what does he say? What's the result? Verse 7. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding can't be explained. I, I, I can't understand it. I can't put it into words. It's just it's, it's there. Shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When your mind is filled with prayer and your heart is filled with praise, your soul can be filled with peace. When you find a child of God who is always rejoicing, gracious to everyone, anxious about nothing, and praying about everything, you'll find one where God's supernatural peace staunchly guards their heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Amen. I could not see through the shadows of head, so I looked at the cross of my Savior. Instead, I bowed to the will of my Master that day. Then peace came, and tears fled away. Rejoicing in the Lord brings great tranquility in your life. But what is the source of that peace? It's the peace of God, it says. God is the source of that peace, for Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Paul wrote to the Philippians about the peace of God, and then he wrote to the Romans about how to have peace with God. And you cannot have the peace of God without first having peace with God. Sinner, do you have peace? peace with God. Christian, do you have the peace of God? It all starts with rejoicing in the Lord. Because rejoicing in the Lord brings great humility. 
Rejoicing in the Lord brings great stability. And rejoicing in the Lord brings great tranquility. God never moves without purpose or plan. When trying his servant and molding a man. Give thanks to the Lord, though your testing seems long in darkness. He giveth a song. If you know the chorus, sing it with me. Oh, rejoice in the Lord. He makes no mistake. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. Make, make the choice to rejoice in the Lord. Make the choice to rejoice in the Lord. It brings great humility. It brings great stability. It brings great tranquility. And you will get to enjoy the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keeping your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you've given us, Lord. Lord, we, we, we deserve to be, because of our sin, we deserve to be traumatized and thrown into hell. But you have such a big, loving heart. And you have such an immense love for us. That you don't want us to even have anything near, near that. Thank you. Thank you for wanting to fill our hearts with peace. Thank you for all the opportunities you've given us. Thank you for arranging the details of our life. Thank you so much for being so good to us. Helps to reflect on that and realize that and, 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 and be so overwhelmed with it that we can't help but rejoice in the Lord. And realize that that's the pathway to peace. It starts with rejoicing. I pray, Lord, that you please help us. Help us to live that out. Through the trials, through the troubles of life, help us to live that out. Help us to realize that you give those things to us to be able to help somebody else with it in the future. With the comfort and the blessing you give us in that moment, you want us to be able to reflect on that, appreciate everything about it, because somebody you're going to bring somebody by our way. Just like we were comforted through a person that you comforted, and we were able to get through a situation that was hard for us, you're going to allow us the same privilege down the road. But we've got to get through it. We've got to learn all the lessons and, and meditate on it and pick it apart so that we can be a blessing to the next person. And for that, we should rejoice in the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for meeting the needs of our heart through your word and through the people in our life. Your representatives, even, even your nature that fills our heart with so much. Please, Lord, help us. Help us to rejoice in the Lord always. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand, please. Come ahead, Miss Melissa, play in an invitation. The altar's open. How about you come and you take time to rejoice in the Lord and just praise Him and thank Him. If it's a trial, if it's a hard time, if it's a tough situation, try rejoicing in the Lord. You'll get more done by surrendering and rejoicing than by begging and pleading. Try it out. Try it out. Be surprised. Let's pray.
Let's grab our songbook and go to number 308. We'll sing the first and last verse of I Surrender All, number 308. That's our closing hymn. Number 308. All to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him, in his presence daily live. I surrender all, I surrender Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill <coughs> love and power, let Thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Yeah. Last fall, um, Brother Gear told me he was uh, splitting some walnut to um, get ready for the winter time, and um, I don't know if you know, but um, I do a little wood carving on the side for fun, just to pass the time. And I had never worked with walnut before, and that's one of the woods that I use, or a fruit and nut wood would be one that I use. So I asked him, I said, could could I have a piece or two of uh, of your wood just to to practice on, to, to, to make something with. And so he, uh, he brought it up, and, and I was working on it. And as I was working on it, was, I was just admiring the beauty that God had, God, God had grown there in that piece of wood. And I kept thinking, this is just like me. I was destined for the fire. And God was, God's been using all of the, his tools to shape and mold me. And that's all of us. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord. Amen. We were destined for the fire. Wow. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. We have no reason to not rejoice in the Lord. Let's make it a daily practice. Amen. We're going to be dismissed in prayer, but before we leave the auditorium, we're going to have the Lord's Supper in just a second. So I'm going to ask Preacher if you would uh, close us in prayer and then everybody be seated. We're going to shut off the live stream and then we're going to observe the Lord's Supper. So, Preacher. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> 